Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool! will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. The Gospel of the Lord. On this sixth Sunday after Epiphany 2023, the word comes to us from St. Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter, illuminating the law. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Rabbis who study the Old Testament have identified 613 laws given by God throughout the entire Old Testament. They're all not in one place. They're spread throughout the Old Testament. 613 laws. And these laws of God are far-reaching. And they cover such things as relationships between people, animal sacrifices for sin, political laws for God's people, how they are to organize themselves dietary laws, and health codes. That's just to name a few. The law of God touches on every aspect of human life. I mean, read through Deuteronomy and Leviticus and other parts of the Old Testament, and there is so much law, it can be overwhelming. That's the intent. 
God's law was not given by God to give His people a ladder to heaven or salvation or to righteousness. One could take it that way, and many do. You can read our lesson from Deuteronomy this morning, Deuteronomy 30, and and people have read it that way, that, that God is giving people a choice. That if you follow the one choice, you're going to get better and better and and make your way into heaven. If you obey the commandments of God, we read in Deuteronomy, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, then you shall live. Therefore choose life. That you and your offspring may live. If you do this, then you will live. And yes, you will. You will. God does not lie. Now, as I mentioned, down through the ages, many took this passage as a guide to the higher and holier life. I choose the way of God. Many have said that. The question is then, how do you make that work? Well, the only way you can make that work is by either minimizing or spiritualizing God's law. Another way to describe it is to soften the bite of God's law. You have to take the bite out of God's law if you're going to, quote, do the law and live. Now Jesus this morning in our Gospel lesson speaks about three commandments. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. The eighth commandment, you shall not bear false witness. So here's how you spiritualize or minimize the law of God. And by the way, we're all so good at this. You shall not murder. How do we just look at that at the surface and just take it at that? Well, I don't carry a weapon with me every day, and I'm not seeking to kill people, and and frankly, I haven't killed anyone that I know of, Um, so I guess I'm good with that. That's the kind of minimized, spiritualized way of looking at that fifth commandment. And of course, the sixth commandment's always in our national conversation these days, and we can certainly minimize that by saying, well, that was then, this is now, it no longer applies. Or the eighth commandment. Well, you know, I, I speak well most times, and, and I try not to, to hurt people and, and say insensitive things most of the time. I've done my best, and that's usually good enough for God. God's good with that. No one's perfect, right? This is how we spiritualize it. This is how we minimize it. This is how we soften the law. We take the bite out of it. I mean, that's what the the Pharisees and the scribes had to do in the New Testament. Because they were on this path. They had chosen the higher, holier way of living by the law. Right? They were on the ladder to heaven. So in order to do that, you've got to minimize it. That's what they were doing. So what's Jesus doing with the law in our Gospel lesson this morning? Because you all heard him. And we all were a little uncomfortable. You have to be. You probably squirmed a bit in your pew because he touched on all of us. What Jesus is doing this morning in this gospel lesson from the fifth chapter of St. Matthew is that he is illuminating the law of God as it was given to Moses. He is bringing light on the actual law of God and in so doing, he is actually doing the law of God to his disciples, to us. He's putting the bite back into the law. He's showing us the seriousness of the situation that we're all in. And there's no minimizing it. There's no softening. There is no ignoring it. The passage that we have from Deuteronomy says, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, then you shall live. Therefore, choose God. Choose life that you and your offspring may live. Sounds wonderful to us. So simple, right? Just choose the better way. 
Just do what's within you and choose the better way. That sounds great to us. And our in self-inflated righteousness, we think to ourselves, that's simple, I can do that. The people who are, have gone off the path, they've just chosen wrongly, we say to ourselves. Well, take that Deuteronomy chapter 30 passage about choosing the way of God, the higher, holier way of God. Give it a go this week. See how you do. And be honest with yourself. You will quickly see that without a doubt, you will fall short. Probably within a few moments of saying or declaring that I've made this decision to go the higher, holier way. And that confession we make at the beginning of the divine service will come rushing right back into your mind. I am in bondage to sin, and I cannot free myself. Why does Jesus illuminate the law of God for us this morning? To show us, before you even have to try doing that, to show us that there is no way out. To show us our waywardness, to shed light on our absolute need for salvation. The great Lutheran theologian, known as the second Martin. You may not have heard of him uh, a whole lot, but his name is Martin Chemnitz. He came the generation right after Martin Luther. He's known as the second Martin in the Lutheran tradition. Martin Chemnitz once wrote this. The benefits of Christ cannot be understood if the nature of sin in us is not known to us. This is why the commandments are the first thing you encounter when you open up the small catechism. To show us our sin. To show us our utter need for salvation from outside of ourselves. To repent us. The commandments in our small catechism then close with a warning from Exodus. So you go through the commandments in the small catechism the next thing you see before you get to the creed is this. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who punishes. God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. And here's the thing. There's not one of us, when you go through those commandments and the explanations, which show the negative and the positive, what you shouldn't do and then what you should do, there's not one of us who has not broken, is not breaking, or will not break any of those commandments going forward. It's that bad. What happens then, once you see this, once you see where you stand in light of those commandments, you become the worst sinner you know. That's to be repented by the law. And that's the law's job. It's painful, no doubt. It's like a surgeon who has to cut in order to heal. So the law of God is given to cut us to the heart. To put us in our grave, really. Put us in our grave so that, so what? So that Jesus will come and pull you out of that damn grave of sin. That's what he does pulls you out of that grave, and he does so with the good news of the gospel, that Jesus has come for all of us who are selfish and, and often heartless people, that Jesus has come for all of us who are lustful adulterers, that Jesus has come for all of us who are liars, slanderers, and gossips. We have often been shown that. That's who we are. And as the old prayer book once said, there is no health in us. And Jesus then comes and pulls us out of the graves of those sins and gives to us new and everlasting life. That's the good news of the gospel. A new life where selfish and cruelty, where sexual brokenness, a new life where false speaking mouths are things of the past for us. Are things of an old life that we no longer want anymore. Living this new life in Christ you're then free. You're free of that old life. You're free of those sins that once dragged you into the grave. They're all behind you now in Jesus Christ. 
and you're free then to not have to show the world that you are a righteous person. Because your righteousness is in Christ. It's not about what you do. It's what Christ has done for you. So you no longer have to hold grudges. You no longer have to hold grudges anymore because you as a Christian forgive as you have been powerfully forgiven in Jesus Christ. So if you're holding a grudge this morning against someone, get it fixed. Learn to forgive. And forgive as you have been forgiven in Christ. Do so before you even come to communion. You don't need a coexist bumper sticker on your car in order to show the world what a good and righteous person you are. Because who cares what the world thinks of you? You know what Jesus thinks of you. And that's all that matters to you, Christian. You no longer need the glory. Because all glory and honor, as it says in Scripture, is given to Christ, who has raised you to a new and everlasting life. So then what comes of that for us? We live lives of thanksgiving to the Lord Jesus, who has shed light upon us and given us hope and life and salvation. And so we continually give honor, praise, and glory to Jesus. And I want to say something to you about that. Get used to it. Because that's what heaven is all about. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.